Well, <clears throat> I wished I could be with you in person, but uh, I do appreciate all that uh, Dr. Ellison and Miranda Small have done in helping us have these webinars. The ones I've been able to be on myself and listen to have been pretty good, so I appreciate this. So today I'm going to share with you some thoughts about this topic and uh, I've got some video clips from some other people with a lot of experience uh, from the ranching side and from the agency side in RCS that I'm going to share with you as well. And uh, so the first adaptive management was practiced by Noah on the ark and this cartoon says, well, so much for the unicorns, but from now on, all carnivores will be confined to sea deck. So let's just talk about uh, what outcome-based or adaptive management is and what it is not. And the things it is not is what has been in the past. And I think uh, all the agencies are embracing uh, this more flexibility now. So what it is, is it's flexible and nimble. What it is not is rigid and prescriptive. Adaptive management embraces the scientific method, whereas the alternative embraces regulation and keeping things in a box. The outcome-based management is focused on the end result and the alternative is fixated on a, following a written plan. There's flexibility and change built into NEPA with both outcome-based management and adaptive management. And for the alternative, each new change requires a new NEPA. Another thing about flexibility I want to just state real quickly is sometimes you're limited by flexibility within the public lands grazing permit regime. And that's that's kind of, uh, that's a real challenge to work around because then you have to be extra flexible on your private ground that you have more flexibility on. Uh, and so one of the things I think is key in that flexibility is trying to implement more flexibility in, in public lands permits. And the way to do that is through the permitting process. The other thing about flexibility. So, uh... This diagram here is from a Forest Service employee in Region 3. And uh, on the top, it shows what has been the standard way of doing things uh, for several decades. And uh, of course, every time a major change happens on uh, a grazing permit, then it requires a new NEPA decision. As you know, those usually don't happen for at least 10 years. It takes two to three years to write one. And so it's just really cumbersome for management. Whereas if we can have adaptability be built into the NEPA with adaptive management, then it's a much easier way of doing management. Adaptive management has been talked about for quite a few years. And uh, most people acknowledge that it's the way to go on these uh, public land ranches because they're so diverse. Adaptive management can be compared to the scientific method. We have a hypothesis that something's gonna work. We apply a prescription on the ground and then we look at effects on the ground to see how it did work. Uh, ideally, that's what NEPA should be about, is that we should be able to monitor the results of what we're doing and practice adaptive management. So let's move into the Forest Service side of uh, this topic. And a lot of the NEPA components of uh, adaptive management are the same as for regular NEPA, but there's some differences. And I've outlined uh, kind of what needs to be in that. At the bottom of the page, and you'll be able to retrieve this later if you look at the web document, is a link to take you to what's called Chapter 90 of the Forest Service Regulations. And that is Chapter 90. 
this has been around for quite a while, at least 10 years or more. I'm not sure how well uh, it has been implemented. I think it's more so now than it was when it first came out. But if you're a permittee, you have a legal right to have section 90 or chapter 90 adaptive management be considered for your grazing permit. And so you should pursue that if you have a permit that's up for renewal. So firstly, uh, we look at the existing conditions. Then we look at the desired conditions on the ground. And then we look at the departures from that desired conditions. So those would be our concerns. And so then we would build some management actions around <clears throat> those concerns. We may have some missing information we need to gather. And so we'd want to be gathering that prior to writing the NEPA. And then uh, as part of the adaptive management process, we need to have decision criteria built into there to help address any management changes that we would want to make in response to conditions on the ground. So that requires thinking about things a little bit and having some good information. And then uh, any type of adaptive management and NEPA, we need to have monitoring built into that. And there's, uh, for the Forest Service, they have two types of monitoring that they specify for NEPA documents. One is implementation monitoring. Now, all that is, is just uh, showing that you have the management action or proposed action has been applied in the manner in which it was described in the NEPA document. The, effective manage, the effectiveness monitoring is to monitor how effective the management action or the proposed and implemented action is in addressing conditions on the ground. If it's not meeting uh, your objectives, then with adaptive management, then you can change that. And of course, the NEPA document would have management alternatives, uh, different uh, proposed actions, and then the preferred, preferred alternative. The preferred alternative is the one the agency ultimately selects. And what you'd like to have happen is for that to be your uh, proposed action that you've developed in lockstep with the agency, with the Forest Service in the NEPA document. And then finally, if there's any type of endangered species, then the permittee should request applicant status so that you'll have standing. Now let's move over into the uh, BLM and that, whoops, sorry. So that is, uh, this is uh, some of my interpretation of what I've read and some of my definitions. Some might disagree, but I think they're pretty accurate. The overall goal of outcome-based management is to maintain or improve ecological, economical, and social integrity while allowing flexibility in grazing to accommodate an ever-changing landscape. Outcome-based management aims to maintain viable and working landscapes that enrich lives, communities, and wildlife populations. And then finally, outcome-based management can be targeted without being prescriptive in nature. So do you ever feel like that uh, you're looking at the same thing and maybe seeing it differently? And so that's where communication is very important in this adaptive management process between uh, the agency employees and the permittees. I think a real key is that monitoring can be the common language. If we look at the same things on the ground and we both uh, parties participate in collecting the data, then we can uh, better uh, come to agreement on what management should be applied. Oftentimes what's happened in the past is that a NEPA document is constructed 
and implemented, and then as an afterthought, monitoring or data collection is added to the NEPA. Uh, it really should be the other way around. The data collection or the monitoring should precede NEPA, and it should help describe and uh, move NEPA in the direction it needs to go. So let's look at this diagram. This is pretty standard uh, in describing adaptive management or outcome-based management. We would assess problems on the ground. We would design some type of management action to address those problems. We would implement those actions. Then when we, we would monitor the results uh, and evaluate how well we met our objectives. And then we adjust things as necessary and continually adapting to the ever-changing landscape on the ground. So adaptability is the ability to change or be changed to fit altered circumstances. It is local-based, land-based experience uh, from the people on the ground is combined with on-the-ground data to assist in guiding grazing, grazing decisions made throughout the year. So let's think about where do you want to go, how do you want to get there, and what's it going to cost you? It may cost you some money, but primarily uh, adaptive management is going to cost you uh, more time, more communication. On the agency side, it would require more meetings with uh, the permittee and, and uh, on the course, the rancher side, it would require more communication, going to meetings, uh, the kind of thing probably you don't enjoy doing, as well as other things. So Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. So let's talk about getting started. Uh, the very first thing you're going to do is want to gather the information from your range file that's in the agency uh, office. You're going to want to look at the age of the data, uh, the type uh, it is, age of us, any type of assessments for BLM, that'd be like the range health assessments for both Forest Service and BLM. You'd have riparian assessments if it's in properly functioning condition and so forth. Historical use, and a lot of times uh, ranchers may have some information here on some of the early use that agency files may not contain, and she, so you should try to get that included. And then you're going to want to assess not only the data in the file, but also get out on the ground and look at things. You're going to want to identify the potential of different parts of the allotment. You want to identify the departures, uh, the concerns that you have from desired conditions. You want to identify missing data and assist in collecting that data. Uh, you want to identify the future range improvements over the next 10 to 20 years, at least, that you uh, would want to have placed on the allotment to make the management more effective. And then uh, you're going to, after you get all this information together, you're going to be trying to write your plan, come up with some alternatives, do that in conjunction with the agency and with other outside people, maybe extension or consultants or whoever, uh, family members, and then uh, establishing benchmarks and adaptive actions that can be pursued with adaptive management. So here's uh, one slide of about two or three from a rancher in Arizona who was pretty astute on uh, this whole procedure. And then he's talking about monitoring and looking at stuff that's in the file. So he says to look at what's been done. What are the results? He made a point there may not be any monitoring. And then uh, reviewing all that information in the file, looking at past allotment uh, operating instructions, annual operating instructions, range inspection notes. He said not to be surprised 
if you don't find any positive remarks, oftentimes people just note what's negative. If you are aware of positive things that have happened, you should point them out in writing. So you may have some old data that uh, needs to be updated. Um, and then uh, field tours. So this is uh, another allotment down in Arizona. This is a soils map. And we're discussing uh, where to go to look at some old key areas and some different parts of the allotment. You want to ground truth what those maps say. They're usually kind of coarse in description and you may find some areas where they may not adequately describe what is on the ground. Something that I wanted to point out that's very important is that everybody needs to agree about the potential of the site. Here we have on the left a site on the uh, upper Sonoran Desert, which is quite different from a site up in the Ponderosa Pine Forest that's shown here in the other picture on the right. The soils will be different, the vegetation will be different, and we can have uh, different uh, guidelines to help us look at that. Ecological site descriptions from NRCS are a good tool. And uh, this is just showing uh, the difference between a north facing and a south facing slope and the types of vegetation that it grows. So talking about monitoring, Yogi Bear, the great philosopher, baseball player said, you can observe a lot by just watching. So do you need to collect more data? If you do, you should be actively involved in that process and not be surprised by what is presented to you. If key areas have to be uh, located or relocated, you should use the collaborative process for doing that. And here I have a picture of a, an extension employee, a forest service employee, and the ranch manager all looking at and deciding on where to place a monitoring site. So as we move into assessment, we look at the NEPA triangle. This would be what's called front loading or gathering information to describe the allotment and to describe how, uh, what problems there may be and why. And then as we look at and synthesize that data, then we're going to describe and talk about what type of management actions we could pursue. So then we move down the proposed action side of the triangle. This goes out to the public for scoping. And then we decide which alternative. We implement that alternative on the ground and then we monitor how effective that it, how it was in solving the issues. So we should use uh, experts to help. Here we're doing some soil profiling. The next uh, little video clip I'm gonna show you is from Rinker Rock Creek Ranch. And it is when we were doing some assessment, we are trying to move into outcome-based management. And you'll see on a field tour we went to, Brandon Brzee from NRCS is describing a couple of different sites that we looked at. So we can look at the history of this and we know that because it's by the road, it's by the water, it's uh, this pipe that we used fairly heavily in the spring, early, early spring, probably right after they started getting kicked off the land. If we just go back and actually get some details from way back home. And so, because it, it stayed open, it dried, and the snow is not going to pile up on the cognac, that's the right direction. So it's going to clear off faster than my country, and this is where they came. And then it's also along the stock driveway that people trail from there to there. And so this is now where historically there was kind of use, and now we're looking at changing, and how do we get that to change and manipulate the plant community? Can we deal with cows alone? Probably not. It'll stay constant, probably. We can do some stuff on the side over here on the other side of the road where it's changed. And the cows come in here and maybe this a little? Yes. We can definitely maintain this in this condition forever. Um, as long as we keep it from burning. 
has a kind of an important thing for that is to manage how this serve is consumed. On this one, it may be on the other side, it could change the timing and the intensity to impact the annuals and increase the benefit and restoration um, potential of those annuals. So you're saying by trying to impact those annuals earlier on, maybe you'd save some moisture for you may, you may actually do it twice. There's two times, right? Um, the new stuff coming out is we get better response out of the perennials by grazing during the dormant season in the fall and winter. Mm -hmm. Because because you're saving some yeah. Because you're saving some moisture. Also, you're removing some of that litter cover, right? Which actually is allowing the germination of the cheatgrass. Right. Um, and then those, those little plants um, dry up over winter. They can't handle it being out. So you're saying maybe a two phase grazing on these areas like this? And then kind of in that intermediate, and that's where your middle state is at a very stable point. It's resistant to change. It's all that disturbing. And then there's a, there's a step on that yellow band. Yeah. If it burns, it's going to look just like that type. Um, you know this, because you've got the same site right over there. If, if it burns, this has really high potential to look like that. Versus if we can work on our management and Pretty obvious, isn't it? No shrubs. A lot more annuals. I think there's more annuals. Yeah, the more annuals, there's also less perennial. Yeah, state two. Annual Sandberg dominated state and this is also a very stable site resistant to change mm -hmm. white things are here and just mow this completely down they will respond and come back exactly the same as so in order to facilitate that we need to adjust when and how much hardest part is the competition this is really going to be hard to transition back to sagebrush Sagebrush means to drop seed on bare soil. Mm -hmm. um, and we haven't had it. And that's what extended rest in these cheatgrass areas is kind of a problem. Because as the litter builds up, a little bit of sagebrush that's left all the way around, we have seed source. This is not an area that we want to plant, right? Because we have seed source within the vicinity, but it still needs bare ground. So. I can't overemphasize how important those field tours are uh, as you move into uh, looking at outcome-based management or adaptive management. And uh, it's a lot more fun than just looking at paper. And you can see things and some things can come to you. As uh, we looked at uh, this video with Brendan Brzee, uh, he was describing it. The first site across the road was this state uh, of vegetation that is relatively unimpacted. And then across the road, he was talking about the state two, which would this be this site over here where you have more invasion of uh, in annual grasses and more uh, susceptible to fire. As you move forward with your uh, plan, you need to consider other mitigating factors and other management actions which may be impacting the things you see on the ground. And so as you gather all this information, you may be presented with a myriad of possibilities that you can pursue for the uh, grazing allotment. I've tried to look at uh, just one outcome here. Uh, ground cover, which is important to help prevent erosion. And so uh, if, if we kind of have a flow chart, first off we'd say is it at or near its potential? 
and are the natural processes in balance with the site capability? If it's not, then we need to look at possible causes. And so we could have livestock grazing could be a cause or natural disturbance could be a cause. If we move over here on the natural disturbance, here's where we can talk about our adaptive actions that could be taken in response to drought, for instance. Of course, we could do the obvious and just decrease the number of animals or the days that they graze the allotment. But there's a lot of other things we could look at too, like uh, uh, installing temporary water sources, pipelines, trucks. Uh, we could uh, open more pastures to make the animals distribute over more country. We could early wean uh, calves. There's just a whole lot of different things that we can pursue. And, and so you should think about all the different options and maybe discuss them in a group setting uh, and get a lot of different perspectives on how to address things. So now that you have your plan, here's another slide from David Cook from Arizona. You present your proposed action to the agency. And this action should be developed, uh, as we said, in lockstep with them. You would have your numbers, your grazing strategy, your adaptive management, some flexibility on numbers, uh, improvements, different things you're going to try to impact on the ground. If you and the agency can't agree, or if there's a large issue between the, your proposed action and what the agency wants to do, then they will develop another alternative as well. But hopefully your communication has been such that uh, the preferred action is the one that you're working on together. And then the agency will prepare, prepare an environmental analysis. This has been happening all along as you've been gathering data. Uh, you should request to review it before it's sent out to the public for comment. There may be some mistakes in it, uh, just inadvertently some mistakes that are made. Uh, if you find some mistakes, you should send in some corrections and maintain good communication once it's sent out to the public, you should ask others to review and comment on it. And very importantly, and I added this, is that you make sure that you comment if you're a permittee on the NEPA so that you have standing if there's any type of appeal that needs to occur. If you have endangered species on the allotment already indicated, you should send in a letter to the agency requesting the applicant status. This will allow you to review the biological opinions and to uh, interact with the agency and with Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, it's your legal right to review the document and to provide input to it. You might even request a meeting with Fish and Wildlife and the Land Management Agency to discuss any issues. So kind of wrapping this part up, uh, adaptive management or outcome-based management. We do preliminary data collection and our long-term observations suggest certain management actions should be taken. The action is vetted with all involved parties. We uh, do some sampling, some monitoring to test for effectiveness and we make sure that we do enough of it that we don't just waste our time and money. We look at any sideboards or mitigation that needs to be applied, especially for endangered species. We get the necessary clearances for implementation. It might be a categorical exclusion. Most of the time it's gonna be a NEPA, uh, environmental assessment. And then uh, we uh, monitor the adequacy of the data collection and the mitigation. We look at any unforeseen events. We analyze the data and we inform management about the effectiveness of our action. And then we're gonna place that action either in our management toolbox or we're going to reject it. And then we're gonna adapt and replan as necessary. So I just listed a few barriers here 
I like this diagram because I don't understand it. Uh, this is one <clears throat> from some economists just talking about risk aversion. It can be quite compliment, uh, complicated, but uh, you know, there is some resistance to change. Uh, the courage to adapt is a gift. The ability to adapt is a skill, but all of us can make a choice to adapt. And that's where we need to have the willingness to adapt and apply adaptive management. Now looking at some, let's look at it from the rancher side, is that you can't propose an action that's going to place your land management partner in jeopardy. They can't uh, get behind some type of action, action that's going to be uh, of issues uh, with uh, Fish and Wildlife Service or with other multiple uses on the allotment. And then on the agency side, we can't make the terms and conditions of adaptive management so burdensome that they make it difficult for permittees to implement it. I think one of the biggest challenges that I've seen in different places is employee turnover uh, with uh, the agencies. People get promoted and move out and maybe you have a great relationship and you're doing some good things on the ground between a rancher, a permittee and the agency and then the person you've been working with gets moved or, or takes a promotion and moves out of the area. Uh, that's where it's very important and uh, that you continue to uh, capture monitoring data and discuss it frequently uh, with the agency. I heard a rancher say once that a rancher needs to be trilingual. They need to be able to speak the language of the agency people, which is data. They need to be able to speak the language of ranchers, which, which is antidotes. And they need to be able to speak the language of environmentalists, which is poetry. So one challenge sometimes is that maybe inappropriate monitoring methods are being try are trying to be applied to attain information that are not um, appropriate. So you need to make sure that what you're trying to catalog and follow that you have the appropriate methodology to do so. Now to finish up, I'm just going to show you a couple of uh, examples. The first example of adaptive management is one which was brought about through much pain, some appeals and litigation, and just a whole lot of heartache and issues. The second one is where adaptive management wasn't applied, but I could see a real uh, advantage for doing so. So this first example is near Tonto Basin, uh, Arizona, and it's from about 4,000 to 5,500 5, feet approximately. It's uh, about a 20,000 acre allotment. And uh, you can see it's in some pinyon juniper country. And uh, so the allotment had, at the time we started monitoring there, there were no cross fences on the entire lot, but there was a small holding pasture in the middle, and there's a, sp a small experimental goat pasture on the edge. But the cattle could go wherever they wanted and stay as long as they wanted. Now all these dots are different monitoring sites. We had several of them located on some of these flat mesas where cattle love to congregate. There was uh, quite a controversy about this. There was some uh, press coverage called Return of the Range War. Uh, just reading one thing, forest officials told Conway they could reduce the family's allotment to zero or they could reduce it to 100 head and decrease it 20% every year after that. Uh, from the Greenback Permittee Bill Conway said, that's the key word, management. 
we've not been able to manage our cattle because we've not been allowed to build fences or improve certain water areas because they never got around to us to create a management plan. Now they're saying we can't do any of this because your land's in bad shape. It hasn't been managed. How can you manage if they won't let you? And so this is where we started and I got involved in helping collect some data to help better describe this. But there were some issues. This is the flat mesa top, one of them. You can see how it looked in 2001. There was virtually no perennial grasses on these mesa tops, just annuals and some half shrubs and you can see some prickly pear. The, uh, the rancher got permission finally uh, about a year or so after this picture was taken to relocate a fence on an old abandoned fence line. It was about 70 or 80 years old. And he was able to put in one cross fence and then subsequently another cross fence or two and develop some water. Now look at this picture. This is what that same site looked at, looked like in four years. We had some pioneering of perennial grasses. Some of these grasses had tumbling seed heads that blew off the side slopes and helped repopulate uh, this site with perennial grasses. So in a matter of four years with some management, we were able to increase the amount of perennial grasses by five times on this site. Uh, when one of the newly arrived agency professionals came during the 2002 drought, he said, this is the worst example of range management I've ever seen in my life. Two and a half years later, the district ranger said, thanks for sharing these photos and the information. It sure appears to be a positive trend on that mesa. The great thing about improving rangeland conditions, as you obviously know, is not only the improved ecological condition, but it produces more vegetation that can be allocated to livestock. This is a good thing and is certainly our objective on the national forest. Let's move to the second example. This is also in Arizona uh, near Sunflower. And there was a big fire that came through this uh, diamond allotment in 2005. This is uh, looking into the sycamore pasture, which had not been grazed for two years. So there was a lot of fuel and it burned really hot on this north facing slope. We're standing in that sycamore pasture looking uh, towards the north. The area in green was an area that was grazed from March through April 15th by 96 cows. And so they consumed a lot of the annuals that helped fuel the fire. This pasture here to the left is, was grazed during October to December. And so the fire didn't burn quite as hot, but uh, more hot than it did in the early spring grazed pasture. But this was very key here. This is the Heber Reno sheep driveway. And so a band of sheep came through in the spring and grazed this belt that went through those torched pastures. And you can see that uh, the fire really just kind of burned in a mosaic and didn't cause a lot of damage in this particular part. So we happen to have some monitoring sites located on this allotment. This is one of the monitoring sites eight months before the fire. And I'm gonna show you a picture here. This is what it looked like seven days after the fire. The ranch manager suggested we go out and take some pictures and compare, uh, and I'm glad we did. This next slide will show you uh, this cane beard grass plant seven days after the fire and how quickly it responds. This is the same site 110 days after the fire. And you can see there's a lot of bare ground there after the fire, but most all of the perennial grasses responded and grew back. And I just want to point out, this is 2.3 years after the fire. I want to point out some data on the bare ground. So we have about, before the fire, about 20% bare ground, which is pretty usual for that part of the world. 
but then after the fire, we were at 47% bare ground for a couple years. And then by two or three years after the fire, then we were back to where it was before for the percent bare ground. Now, what I'm going to point out here is that it's pretty common practice to remove livestock from an area for up to two years after a fire. But what I would point out is if you had some adaptive management in place, maybe on the year or two, the year of the fire, or maybe the year after, after the grass had grown back and set seed, you could come in here after seed set and graze this area and knock some of that litter down on the ground and provide more soil protection. So with that, 